Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study, the last study of this week on the last morning study this week, uh, dealing with Daniel chapter 11. And um, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> now, dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time that we have here this morning, once again, to look at these lines and to understand them. And we're thankful for uh, the way that you've directed and guided in how we have studied. And we just pray for uh, your continued um, leading. We ask that we can have an open heart and mind to accept things uh, that may not fit our present understanding. Um, but we know, Lord, that uh, when you reveal things to us, that truth will fall into place even when we are corrected. And so we just ask that we can be corrected. Be with each person who is studying these things. May your angels watch over them. And may you be here in this study through thy spirit. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. Now, I, I want to make a comment because uh, yesterday I mentioned, you know, Colin had sent uh, an email and, and and other people have been sending me emails occasionally. And, um, and I prefer that people put those comments on the videos themselves. One is other people can see them. Um, and, you know, I usually if it's something that's pertinent to our discussion, I'm going to mention it in the study, uh, but not not unless somebody watches that study, they're not going to see the comment. So, um, you know, my preference is that people, instead of commenting to me, uh, that they put the comment on the video that they've been studying. They can mark the time, some point, and then if we need to discuss something about that, then we can have a discussion on, on the video and everyone can see it. That's my preference. I, I don't get a lot of comments on the videos, um, so but I, I do like when there is comments on the videos. And uh, so if somebody does send me something, generally I'm going to have to, you know, if it's going to be pertinent, I'm going to, going to have to discuss it in the video anyway. But as again, not everybody can see it. Um, okay. So uh, yesterday we had gone through uh, this diagram at the bottom. I just posted, pasted this onto this uh, chart that we had dealing with um, the gematria and the strong numbers with Daniel, Hananiah, Michelle, and Azariah. So I just put it on this page. But it's really what we're looking at at the bottom is this line. So we, we looked at this line and we looked at some of the problems. We also looked at uh, Colin's um, line, though he does it like on the charts, he does it vertically rather than horizontally, but it's still the same thing. And then we looked at the kingdoms. So um, the idea here with the kingdoms is you have um, in Daniel chapter 2, you have Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, and Rome. There isn't a distinction made between Rome pagan and Rome papal, uh, but we do see that Rome's divided. And Rome is divided uh, really first in pagan Rome, because pagan Rome falls, and it's, it's divided, and then ultimately uh, that morphs into a papal Rome. But in Daniel chapter 2, uh, we don't see... Um, you know, we, we don't see these distinctions that I drew before, below this. So we can take, um, and I guess what we should do just to kind of finish this off a little bit, even though we're going to come back to it. So we know here that Babylon is, is going to be typical of the end of the world, right? Now, uh, spiritual Babylon... So we have literal Babylon that's going to fall. We also have spiritual Babylon. So spiritual Babylon is the papacy. So I'm just going to put here, um, you know, you have the papacy. And for some reason, this is in a white font. So I'm going to get, change that font color. Um, okay, there we go. It's also in bold, but anyway. 
And then following the papacy, we have the USA, right? And that's going to parallel Persia. And then we have the UN, and that's going to parallel Greece. And then we have uh, Rome again, which is the papacy. Does that make sense? It looks logical. Yeah, all we did is we took those bottom four and we moved them up and lined them up with the top four. Right? So, so we know that this is the truth. Now, this also comes from our application of the seven heads of Revelation 17. But that, that application that we make of Revelation 17, uh, when we looked at it in trying to understand the presidents of the United States, we could see it's not what the pioneers understood. Now, a simple argument would be, well, we have more light than the pioneers, and they didn't understand it. Now, the thing that I've always found about um, the pioneers is either they were correct about things, but not um, not complete, that is, they were right, but sometimes more right than they knew. That is, they were pointing to something that they didn't fully see or understand. Or sometimes they made errors. And that is, they would make errors in the applications of Miller rule, Miller's rules. Um, but those, those mistakes that they would make uh, were usually providential. So that wasn't just that they, um, you know, had some right things and some wrong things. Uh, the wrong things that they, they had wrong were wrong for a reason. That is in God's providence. And, and those, those mistakes that they made were in God's providence there to help us at the end of the world. <clears throat> yeah, so we could put here modern Rome. If, if we wanted to put this here, um, just because Iran is sort of, uh, when we, when we look at this, um, the papacy here, I mean, we could just say modern Rome, right? And we could do that. Now there are, there are some ideas that I've seen, uh, presented where the idea that this is modern Rome is wrong. And, and, I, and I'm really puzzled at that. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to go into that right now. We're going to get into that sometime later. But there, there are people who question the idea of modern Rome. Um, uh, not so much in this movement, but um, uh, in Adventism, in, in how these things are applied. Now, when, when I first became an Adventist, the, the prevailing view of understanding uh, these kingdoms that we see here um, were embodied in a book by Roy Allen Anderson um, dealing with Revelation. I can't remember the exact title of the book. Um, and they would always put uh, Babylon, Medo-Pers, Greece, Rome pagan, Rome papal. And then they would put uh, spiritualism. So they wouldn't put the United States as uh, the sixth uh, kingdom, and which which really doesn't make any sense to not put the U.S. there because Ellen White puts them there, right? She puts them there in 1798. Um, spiritualism comes later, which um, you know in its in its uh, role or function, you know, we see with of course it's there in a sense in 1798 through France, uh, but we see it more embodied in communism. So often they equate spiritualism with communism. And um, so they uh, so they have this this idea, um, which which I don't fully understand. Now, one of the things we know is that Jeff, in putting the USA there, he also refers to uh, prophecies in Isaiah dealing with uh, the 70 years, which are the days of one king. And we know that that's the United States. So the United States has this period that's tip, that's symbolized as 70 years, the days of one king. 
Now, um, also when I first became an Adventist, there was a book called Our Day in Bible Prophecy, I believe it was called, something like that, that was made in the 1920s. I think Spicer might have been the main author of that book. Um, and in that book, they talk about uh, um, the League of Nations as sort of fulfilling that role, in the, because it's obviously before the United Nations. And um, a lot of these have to do with this idea of the dividing of the toes. So we're going to have to look at some of these things in detail. We're going to have to go back and look at how these things are understood. But we're not going to do that right now, just kind of reviewing uh, what we did yesterday. Now, what I'm more interested in right now that I think we have to put in place is in this slide here. Now, it's probably a little tiny for some people's screens or devices. Um, but what we have here is, is um, on the top line, we have Daniel chapter 11, verse 2, right? Or 1 and 2. So you have Darius the Mede. Right. You're going to have this reference back to Darius the Mede. But it's in the time of Cyrus. And then you have the three that stand up, Cambyses, False Myrtis, and Darius the first. And then you have the fourth, who is far richer than them all, and he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. And so that's the four, the, the one, two, three, four at the top of that diagram. And then, of course, we have this numbering of the kings of Persia. We would have Cyrus, Cambyses, False Myrtus, Darius I, Xerxes, Artabanus, and Artaxerxes. Now, this study came from the study at the bottom. So at the bottom, you're going to see the, the last kings of Judah. Now, this study originally was given by Jeff in 2013. Uh, not in its completeness, but in its a sort of embryonic state. It's going to be expanded in 2014. And, and what happened in 2013 is at the camp meeting in Alberta in August of 2013, I prepared a paper um, addressing the parallels between Leviticus 26 and the book of Daniel. So Leviticus 26 as a proto-Daniel, that is, it gives the seed that's then going to be expanded in the prophecies of Daniel. So the prophecies of Leviticus 26, dealing with the four seven times, are answered and expanded upon in the book of Daniel. And in doing that, I came to recognize that with these seven kings of Judah, there are four events, one marked at, in Manasseh's reign, uh, one marked in Jehoiakim's reign, one in Jehoiachin's reign, and another in Zedekiah's reign, that fulfill the four seven times. And Jeff presented basically the same idea at that camp meeting, and we both had discovered this uh, the week prior to the camp meeting. So he was presenting something that was new to him, and I was presenting something new to me, and they were the same idea, the four seven times were four events fulfilled by literal Israel. And I had a bit more of an idea of the chronology of this than, than Jeff did. Um, and also an idea that uh, they commenced periods of 70 years. But I hadn't worked out all that chronology yet. I just had this idea uh, of that. So that's going to be worked out over the next year into 2014. And, and even into 2016, where we, we definitely get the chronology uh, refined. <clears throat> now, the idea then of these seven kings of Judah. Okay, so the idea of these. The idea of these uh, seven kings of Judah is that. Um, that is going to be developed into the idea of, well, the last seven kings and the first seven kings. So we're going to look at the first seven kings, this movement is, of Judah. So going back to Rehoboam. 
And then we're going to look at um, uh, the last seven kings of um, Israel. So, and we're going to lay these out and try to understand what they mean. There's also a connection there with the seven thunders. The idea is that these seven are the seven thunders. And we know the seven thunders um, are understood differently within this movement at different times. Um, Jeff has recently done a paper on the seven thunders. It's quite different um, from the papers and, and the ideas that he had in the past. So I think people should look at that new paper dealing with the seven thunders. Um, because in the past, they definitely had them as seven way marks in Millerite history. And he's, he's sort of narrowing the focus of where those seven thunders fit and, and how he sees them. And, and I've only skimmed over the paper. I can't remember all the details of it. Um, but the idea here is that we have these seven kings and later on, uh, we're going to, uh, um, connect those seven kings to the seven, um, uh, uh, to the seven Roman emperors. I think he does that in 2016. He's going to look at the emperors. So you can see here we have uh, these emperors. Um, but it's also connected with the idea of Trump. But they're not going to always be the seven, right? That is, when we deal with the presidents of the United States, we're not going to be writing out seven presidents of the United States, right? We're, we're just going to take uh, what's in Daniel chapter two, and we're going to line Xerxes up with Trump, and then we're going to stop at Trump. He's the last president of the United States. Now, why is that? Uh, is there any logic behind what Jeff did in just stopping with Trump and not seeing that there would be other presidents? You know, that's kind of a Strange question or sort of open-ended question. I does, mean, does it make sense? Doesn't this fall in the same pattern with the Millerites that they saw the coming of Christ was going to occur in 1844 and they didn't see the relevant, the basically the third angel's message being relevant for their time. Right. And, and actually, they didn't even really understand the first and second angel's messages. Correct. In looking over the writings, they, they, didn't, they didn't grasp what those messages were and how to place them chronologically. It's not until they get up to uh, the seventh month movement, basically after the first disappointment, that they start talking about uh, the second angel's message, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, right? So they, they've, they've not recognized prior to that that they're in these messages, that they're not like placing them chronologically in any way. But even when they deal with the Babylon has fallen, has fallen, they really don't even look at the third angel's message. That is, they're focused upon the second, they recognize that they've passed through the first angel's message, uh, but they don't have any application of the third angel's message. So I think what you're saying is correct. That is, we could see so far, but we couldn't see, we couldn't see what we couldn't see, right? It wasn't the time to see it. And so, but you can see the inconsistency of how we're laying out these kings if we're just going to stop with Trump. Right. I hope people can see that, that it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't follow that we should just stop with Trump. Now, um, so you can see basically on the bottom, on the bottom of that first line, right? You got Reagan, He's parallel with Darius the Mede, Bush the first with Cyrus, Clinton with Cambyses, Bush the second with Paul Smirtis, Obama's Obama with Darius, and then Trump with Xerxes. 
But if we had the first seven kings of Persia and we had, you know, the last seven kings of Judah, and you're going to be talking about the United States, it would just seem more consistent to have the last seven presidents of the United States numbered in some way. But also they need to be connected to some kind of time at the end, right? So you couldn't just say, well, Trump's going to be the seventh and, you know, and count back to the previous uh, presidents before Reagan, you know, add a couple in there because you're not in the time of the end. So one of the things about this is we're lining up the first seven kings of Persia with the last seven kings of the United States. Now, Jeff also did things in lining them up with presidents at the beginning as well, both with the Congress, Congressional Congress, what what's no the con what's it called? Can't think of it. The, what was the first sort of government that they had? Constitutional Congress or what was it called? Dwight, you know what it was called? What did they call it before they had the presidents? I think, they had, I think it was the uh, Continental. Oh, Continental Congress? Yes. Okay. Okay. Con that makes sense. Okay. Continental Congress. Okay. So they had this Continental Congress. They had, and Jeff looked at these different uh, presidents and uh, of these, you know, pre um, United States presidents. And then, um, and then, of course, you're going to have the first presidents and, and so forth. So you're going to have all of these things lined up, but you always have seven. So the last seven presidents of the United States, we never really talked about. That is, we just went up to Trump. And if you're going to do the parallel with Persia, Trump would be the fifth. Now, you can see um, below that, the second line, that's Collins' line. Right. So instead of being vertical, it's just horizontal here. Um, and you can see that he's going to count Reagan as number one. So when he says five are fallen, that's going to be Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush the second and Obama. And then the one that is is going to be Trump. And then there's one yet to, yet to come. And when he comes, he continues but a short space. And then and then he has the eighth as being Trump again. Right. So this is this. Revelation 17. But I don't see how we can count them in this way. Is there any way that we could count them in this way? Is there any precedent for it? Is there any logic to it? So when we look at this diagram here, um, you know, if we're going to count these eights, I mean, we would have to say these are the eight and we could line up then, uh, you know, the presidents of the United States, because that's how you would have to do it. You would have to take these kingdoms of Bible prophecy, these seven heads that we do as Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, Pagan, Rome, Papal, the U.S., the U.N., and then you would have to line up the presidents of the United States the same way, right? Um, but you couldn't start with Reagan. You would have to start with Bush the first if you're going to be consistent. Is that making sense to people, what, I, what I'm saying here? Okay, so let's leave that aside for now. Let's look at the bottom one. So the bottom ones, Manasseh, Ammon, Josiah, Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, Jehoiachim, Zedekiah. And, and then I have Christ at the end. Now, the way that we did this is we said, well, there's the last seven kings of Judah. And we take that verse that says he shall overturn, overturn, overturn it until he come whose right it is. And we know historically that at the time, uh, Zedekiah is captive to Babylon, and then it's going to be overturned to Medo-Persia, and overturned to Greece, and overturned to Rome. 
and then he shall come whose right it is. So that's Christ. So Christ is going to come in the time of Rome. And so we can see that the eighth here is Christ. And, and we can see then that Revelation 17 is a counterfeit of this, right? It's a counterfeit resurrection because, you know, Christ is, of course, crucified and resurrected. You know, that's the model. And uh, at the end of the world, this power that's resurrected um, is definitely counterfeiting this line. Now, we also looked at you know, different ideas that people have had regarding popes and things like that. Um, the only one that I find really intriguing was the one by uh, Ralph Meyer. And um, uh, I still think there's problems with it, but it, it's more consistent. And, you know, maybe someday we'll figure out exactly what he was doing there and how it fits. But uh, for now, um, we know that when we're going to be applying uh, these seven heads, in Revelation 17, which we're not going to look at right now, but when we're going to apply them, we know that people have applied them in various ways. And um, the pioneers, the Miller, the Adventists pioneers, people like uh, Jan Andrews and uh, Joseph Bates, they would have applied those, uh, and James White, to systems of government. So the heads represented forms of Roman government. They didn't represent uh, um, individual uh, kingdoms or uh, individual uh, people, right? And so when we apply them to the presidents of the United States, so when we're going to take the seven heads, um, do we have to start uh, where do we have to parallel this with the the seven president or the, the last seven kings of Judah that is if we're going to look at this bottom line right we could take these two lines and put them together I guess I could do this um, do it like this. Just it makes it maybe a little bit easier. Now, if I was going to line this up like this, so I'm just doing this temporarily, um, Reagan would have to be number one. Right, Ammon would line up with Bush, so Reagan would line up with Manasseh, Ammon, Ammon with Bush, Josiah with Clinton, Jeho Jehoahaz with Bush the second, Jehoiakim with Obama, Jehoiachin with Trump, Zedekiah with Biden, and Trump with well, um, the line that I have here, Christ. Does this make any sense? I've had my problems with that type of a lineup. Okay, well, so what are the problems specifically? So let's just kind of discuss it. So could we line up Manasseh with Reagan if we're dealing with the last seven? Uh, and, and we remember, we have the first seven kings of Persia and the last seven kings of Judah. We've lined those up, right? So if we're going to line up, these, you know, we would line up Cyrus with Manasseh, right? Ammon with Cambyses. Right. Okay. Right. So you would see the line would look like this. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, so that means the numbering would change, right? Manasseh would be the first, but he would line up with Cyrus, who is the first, right? Right. Okay. So... He's the first of the last seven, 
Cyrus is the first of the first seven. But they would have to line up in this way. So these numbers at the bottom wouldn't make sense, right? Correct. He would still be the first, but he wouldn't line up with Darius because Darius isn't the first. So you'd have to line up in that way, right? So if you put them like this, you could see that's how they would line up. So Zedekiah would be the last of these, of these seven, and he would line up with Artaxerxes, who's the seventh. Right? So that, that makes sense then? That, that, that's, that's how we did it. Correct. Okay. So we didn't do it this way that you see on the bottom here, or, or um, like we didn't do it here. So you put it down on the bottom. We didn't line up Manasseh like this. I guess I could just do it like that. We didn't line them up like that. Zedekiah would line up with Artaxerxes. Okay. So it's, it's a major problem that we have to sort through. Um, definitely this would contradict what we taught. Um, now we also have uh, these kings here. So when we would line this up, we have, so, so part of what Jeff is doing, I'm just gonna put this down here for now, just leave that there. Um, <clears throat> So when we were dealing with the emperors, um, he's just going to take part of this story and line it up. So he's going to line up Trump with Tiberius, right? Right. Okay. Now, it's not really complete. I mean, we can see that there's characteristics there. Um, now, as far as as... Uh, the emperors are concerned. The first em emperor is Augustus, right? And on this line, I don't have Julius Caesar because Julius Caesar doesn't count. He's not, he's, not, he's not the first emperor. That's not imperial Rome under Julius Caesar, correct? That's, you know, but that's accepted. Yeah, yeah, it's well known that, that, Imperial Rome begins with Augustus Caesar. Okay. And now I don't remember all the details of why Jeff did what he did, but I just know that he lined up uh, Tiberius with, with, with Trump and Augustus with Obama, with the taxation, right? Now he didn't, as far as I know, I, I don't remember him going back and lining up these, uh, em you know, the, well, the emperors in the same way that he did with the kings, right? He didn't, he didn't look at the seven. Now, if we do look at the seven, um, there's different ways in which we could do this. Now, I have here 10, and, and the reason why I have 10 is it was commonly understood that the 10 because we have seven heads, the seven forms of Roman government, and then you have 10 horns, and those horns represent the emperors themselves. And those would be the 10 Roman emperors, beginning with Augustus. And, and the last here you're going to see is, is Titus of the 10. So this is, this is how it would have been understood by many, many commentators understand it this way. Um, and and in, in the pioneers, there was variations of this understanding. And so this wasn't something that was solidified in the pioneers' understanding of things. So so when you have the ten here, it's not the same as the seven. Um, but you sort of could you know look at because uh, what what's going to happen here is you're going to see that there's. Um, uh, there's these, these 10 emperors. Now Titus is under Vespasian. He's going to be the general who, who destroys uh, Jerusalem and the temple, right? Because Vespasian, he's uh, the emperor from July 1st in 69. 
uh, to the 23rd of the 24th of June of 79. And then Titus, who was the general that destroyed Jerusalem, he's then going to become emperor. So he's not um, the emperor at the time that he uh, destroys Jerusalem. It's going to be, you know, nine years before he becomes emperor. Um, and then Odilio in his study, uh, and we're going to look at these things all again. I'm just kind of going over this broad overview. Um, he looks at Nero, and Nero is very interesting because he's going to reign from the 13th of October in 54 to the 9th of June in 68. And why is that significant, those dates, October 13th and June 9th? What are those dates? June 9th, October 13th. How about June 9th, 2018 to October 13th, 2018? What's that? I know you guys know. It's not the hundred days. Hundred and twenty-six days. Is it hundred and twenty-six days of prayer? No, no, it's the hundred and twenty-six days from when. So from when time setting comes into the movement on June 9th, that's going to be that prayer that Jeff has, um, that closes the Sabbath at 9:11 p.m. Mm -hmm. And then there's going to be hundred and twenty-six days to noon on October 13th. 2018, when we count 391 and a half days to November 9th, 2019. So, so the fact that Nero has those two dates for the beginning and the end of his reign is extremely significant, can't be ignored. Also, we have the burning of Rome under Nero on July 18th. So July 18th, uh, was it 51? Uh, I'm trying to think. No, not 51. 57? I can't remember the year when uh, the burning of Rome occurred. But um, so these are things that Odilio brings out. So what's the significance then with Nero? It's 64, so July 18th and 64 AD. So what's the significance there? If we have these, these symbols under Nero, uh, we would line Nero up with, because what Odilio does is he's gonna start with Julius Caesar as number one, and Nero is going to be number six, being Trump, right? Because he's going to want to start with Reagan. He's going to start with Julius Caesar. So he's going to have Nero as, as number six. So, so what's the problem here? As we said, Caesar doesn't count as an emperor. And how can we how can we fit this in to what we understand about the set the seven heads? Is is there some way in which this can be understood? Because we're going to come back to this, but I want you to think think ahead here a bit. No pun intended. So if we take the idea uh, that Nero is, is typifying Trump, is that fair enough to say? That there's the symbols here that puts this with Trump.
You guys all uncommittal? Do we have the symbols there necessary to line up Nero with Trump instead of Tiberius, as Jeff had done? Is Odilio correct in lining up Nero with Trump? You're just going to let me do that? No comments? Yeah, I think there is uh, some connections there. Um, it's just that I was painting there. I didn't want to get my phone okay. full of paint. You know, I can take <laughs> yeah. my gloves off, you know. So okay. um, I, think, I think it's a, an interesting idea. And you have after Nero 64 AD, um, there is there's quite a few sort of emperors after that. I think there's one year that there's three right. emperors and all in a short time. And yeah. Yeah, and in, in a sense, in some ways, they're contemporaneous. I mean, decides, you know, from whose perspective, who's actually the emperor at the time. Um, right, because they're, they're competing, basically. Now, now this allows us some some ways in understanding that there's something going on because you're going to have uh, Otho, Vit Vitellius, and Vespasian, um, and really even Galba. Galba is going to be in 69. He dies January 15, 69, and then you're going to have Otho from January to April of 69, and then Vitellius from April to December of 69. Um, and then we have Vespasian is from July 1st. So you can see he overlaps with Vitellius, if I have those dates right, um, uh, in 69 to uh, June of 79, right? So, so we have these, this overlap of these, these, these two emperors there, plus those three that all occur in one year. And so, I don't know how to apply that. I mean, in some ways you could just say, well, maybe there's three that are sort of, uh, you know, divided in, in, in the sense the kingdom is divided into three parts or something. And then, so that would be like the sixth um, kingdom. And then you'd have Vespasian would be the seventh. And then Titus coming back is the eighth, something like that, right? So I don't know what the best, Best way, how the what's the best way to understand that? But the thing is, you do have this situation where Nero appears to align with Trump. Now he's also the fifth. If we look, if we do the count for uh, the, from the time of the end, right? And and also the other thing about Augustus is, uh. We know that Caesar is not the emperor. Well, he's not the emperor, but he's not there at the time of the end, right? Augustus is the one who is emperor when Christ is born, right? And John the Baptist, marking the time of the end. Would, would we agree with that? That if you're gonna take the time of the end here, and apply it to the line of Christ and these emperors, uh, you would have to say that the time of the end is, the, is in Caesar Augustus. So we, we have to start with Augustus as number one. So Nero is number five, not number six. And then we also see that Trump is number five, not number six. So we could easily take these, um, just up to these five here, not dealing with the rest of those. And we'll put them up here. You know, I have to space them out a little bit more. But, you know, I'd have to, you know, Nero's going to be number five. Here, maybe I'll put them under here like this. Uh, Claudius would line up with Obama. 
Caligula would line up with Bush the second. Tiberius would line up with Clinton, and Augustus would line up with Bush the first. Right. So this type of lineup um, seems to work. Where we have the problem is we now know that we have a whole bunch of of emperors, Galba, uh, Otho, and Vitellius, who really are the seven, right? That is, or the sixth, pardon me. So they would line up with, with Artabanus here, right? So they're going to be the sixth kingdom, the sixth emperor, or whatever you want to call it. They're, they're, they're vying for that position all in the same year. And then Vespasian would be lined up with Artaxerxes, right? And then, of course, here we had still put, you know, Biden and then whoever's going to be here as the seventh, who's ever going to follow Biden. Like if we were to do it that way. And I'm not saying that this is how we would do it. I'm just saying that when we start to look at what we've done in the past and we want to to do it now in the present, we want to look at, at these lines, it, it doesn't really fit, um, that is, it's inconsistent with what we did in the past, and we'd have to have a good reason to change that. If uh, mm -hmm. Galba also put on the Petilius, yeah. if you're going to group them as the six, you know, you have maybe a six, 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 Okay, it's kind of interesting. And, and I haven't yeah. looked at them in detail. There's probably a lot more that we could uh, uh, see if we, we spent time looking at their history. Um, you know, things that are interesting, as you see, Vitellius is from April 19th. You know, I mean, that's when he begins to reign in 69. Um, um, uh, and to the 20th of December. Um, so, I mean, whether that means anything, I don't know, but, you know, there's things like that. Or you have Vespasian, you have this July 1st, 69. So obviously his reign overlaps with Vitalius's. Um, but that's, you know, the first day of the seventh month, which is also another symbol. And uh, the 23rd to 24th of June is when he dies in 79. Um, you have, yeah. uh, you have um, William Miller dying on the 20th of December, 1849. Okay. So that would be 1,780 years later. I know, I know that it's like, uh, and the Julian there and, and um, Another would be the Gregorian, so you have that sort of to consider, but you have both um, the uh, the twentieth of December, maybe yeah. being marked. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So so there's lots of things that we can discern because we're gonna go through this in a lot more detail. We're gonna take time going through these emperors and, and try to understand this history better. But I'm just pointing out that we have we have inconsistencies in how these different lines are proposed. It is what, what Colin presents, what Odilio presents, what Jeff has presented, what we understood in the past. There's things that don't line up, and I don't know the answer to it because we haven't gone through it yet. I mean, I've gone through it a little bit with the presidents of the United States, but mostly what I noticed is there's just there's problems, right? There's something we have to sort out. Something we have to see. Um, so yeah, I mean the idea if you take that there's three sixes, well that's six six six, and that's going to line up with the sixth way mark, and then you would have the seventh way mark would have Vespasian, and that's going to be when the temple is destroyed in 70 A.D. Um, so that sort of works, you know, so you got Nero's number five, Galba, Otho, and Vitellius are number six. There's three of them. And then 
Vespasian is number seven. And then Titus becomes the 10th emperor, but he's also the eighth, right? And, and you can see he was the one who destroyed Jerusalem. And uh, the other thing in the time of Titus, so his reign is from uh, the 24th of June in 79 to the 13th of September in 81. What happens during the reign of Titus that's of significance? Symbolically. Was that when uh, Pompeii was destroyed? Yeah, Pompeii is going to be destroyed in that uh, history, right? So you're going to have Mount Vesuvius erupting. Uh, there's various ways in which uh, modern scholarship has moved it to uh, the autumn. Um, it used to be the date that they had um, was more in the summer of 79. But, it's, but they now have the autumn of 79. But anyway, the point is, it's going to be during the reign of Titus. And one of the ways that I look at Vesuvius is that it is a response by God uh, to what happened with the destruction of Jerusalem. Does that seem like a fair observation? Or is that just, you know, a coincidence? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I think the, the soldiers that were destroying Jerusalem, they were on leave, in a sense. Uh, and they went to Pompeii, I believe it was them, who destroyed Jerusalem, actually. Yeah, uh, Pompeii, yeah. Killed. Right. So, yeah. So that's my understanding. And, and Herculeum as well, which was also destroyed. Um. But yeah, Pompeii was kind of like, well, I guess, a resort or something like that. It had that uh, characteristic to it. So, yes. Yeah. So the destruction of Pompeii is in a response to the destruction of Jerusalem. They're connected. And, and so it's going to be Titus who destroys Jerusalem, not that he particularly wanted to destroy the temple, but it was. The temple is destroyed. And then you're going to see uh, in, during his reign, this destruction of Pompeii. So, um, so there's, so there's some things, some symbols here within these emperors. And there's probably a lot more uh, that we could look at. Now, I remember in 2016, uh, when Jeff, uh, Jeff started looking at Augustus and Tiberius and, and so forth. In Tiberius, particularly being a representative of of Trump, um, even though at that time in 2016 Trump wasn't yet elected, so this would have been in uh, late uh, July, early August that Jeff started doing these presentations about uh, the emperors of Rome as having these parallels. And I probably need to go back and look at those studies because um, I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. Right then I had just done the studies on Ezekiel and Jeff had been handing out those uh, DVDs while he was going around talking about the emperors. He was handing out the DVDs on um, Ezekiel that were recorded um, on uh, July uh, 16th in 2016. So he, he handed those out. Um, and so I know before we came back to Canada, so that was in the beginning of August, uh, Jeff was already talking about this. But I, I didn't pay a lot of attention, um, and, I, and I wasn't really satisfied with what Jeff was saying. I, I, I thought there were things that didn't make sense to me. Um, there were some things that did make sense, but some things didn't. Um, but we have this parallel of Tiberius with, with Trump. And, and I don't think that that's necessarily wrong. I just think that's another application, that there is some parallels there. Um, but I, I think what Odilio has done in laying out these emperors is much more consistent, only that he makes a mistake of counting Caesar as an emperor. And it, and remember, we're going to have to have the time of the end. Caesar isn't there at the time of the end. Julius Caesar isn't. It's Augustus Caesar. 
And um, so you would have to start counting with Augustus. So that's that's where I would differ with what Odilio was doing. Now, there was also some other things about uh, this destruction of Jerusalem where uh, Odilia was trying to tie this into, um, you know, some of the conspiracy theories, which, which again, I disagreed with. Now, um, and one is, I, I don't definitely, I definitely don't think it fits with the conspiracy theories having to do with 9-11, because Trump isn't the president during 9-11. Um, uh, but definitely it lines up more with the July 18, 2020 symbol that is in that history with Nero. So um, so these are the things that we're going to have to do. Uh, but I think where we should start is looking at uh, the studies dealing with, because um, we already looked at the kings of Persia. So we would need to start looking at the studies dealing with uh, the last seven kings of Judah. Okay. Does that make sense? We need, we need to clear up some of those things. Um, so I'm just going to go look through my slides here really quickly because I know I have some other slides. Okay. So this would be um, the last seven kings of Judah and the four seven times. So we have, and we, we talked about this, of course, we have Manasseh. It is going to, he's going to begin a period, his captivity begins a period of 70 years. And that 70 years is going to end when Daniel is taken captive. So in that period, there's going to be Manasseh. He's going to reign for another you know, 35 some years, 35 years or so, whatever it is. And then Ammon's going to reign for two years and then Josiah for 31 years. And then Jehoahaz for three months. And then in the third year of Jehoiakim, Daniel's taken captive. So how did Jeff address these? These, these, because we don't have the numbers there, I just put the one to four for the four seven times. I probably have another diagram that has already done that. Let me see here. Okay. Ah, here it is. Okay, so this is the line that Jeff had. You got Manasseh. His name means causing to forget. So why does, what's the symbol there with Manasseh? Now notice I have these numbers going frontwards and backwards. That, that Jeff didn't do that, I did that, so. I would connect with Isaiah, chapter 26, of the days of one king, or is it, sorry, Isaiah, is it? 23 or 26, somewhere around there. It says okay. the days of one thing to be forgotten. Okay, yeah, so that is, um, I'll just find it here quickly. You know, and some of this is old stuff that we studied in the past, but we're not as familiar with it as we should be, at least I'm not. Um, yeah, it's 23. <clears throat> so Jeff has a recent study on this in his papers. And in, in Isaiah and Ezekiel, they both deal with Tyre, but they're different symbols. Um, now here, this is the burden of Tyre. That's, the, that's a prophecy regarding Tyre. How ye ships of Tarshish. For it is laid waste so that there is no house, no entering in from the land of Chittim. It is revealed to them. Right. So we're going to see some symbols that are we, we see in um, Daniel chapter 11. And uh, it's going to talk about Tarshish and so forth. And then it says, how ye ships of Tarshish. 
for the strength is for your strength is laid waste, and it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten seventy years, according to the days of one king. After the end of the seventy years shall Tyre sing as an harlot. So where do we place that seventy years? Yeah, from 1798 to the Sunday law. Okay, so in our history, we place it from 1798 to the Sunday law. Okay, where do we place this historically? This 70 years. What period of 70 years is it? Because there's different periods from, of 70. Yeah, from 609 to 539 BC. Right, so this is going to be the 70 years uh, for Babylon. 70 years for Babylon. So Babylon uh, here is, is this power that's going to be in power. And Tyre, what is Tyre representing here? Because we put it in 1798 to the Sunday law. So what is Tyre representing here? The papacy. Yeah, so the papacy... So during the time of the United States, because the United States rises in 1798, we have this symbol of Tyre. Tyre here is the papacy that's going to be forgotten. So we, we line that up with Manasseh. Okay. So... Now, the thing about Manasseh is he does begin a period of seven years. It's not the same period of seven years. It's a different period. Um, but it's going to be the period of 70 years until uh, Daniel's taken captive. Okay. Now, then we have uh, after Manasseh. So we're going to say Manasseh is 1798. So Ammon is a skilled workman. That's what his name means. And that's primarily what we looked at was the meaning of their names. There's lots of things that we could probably still look at with these kings that we have not looked at. But at that time, we had this the, the idea of a skilled workman. And, and so what did we line that up with in Millerite history? Was that an increase of knowledge? Yeah, it was either the increase of knowledge or the, actually the formalization of the message. Right? So I'm not certain exactly which it was, but I would say it makes more sense with the formalization of the message. And then, then we have Josiah following and he's the foundation so we know that this is you know if you're going to just if you're just going to take these way marks you know as the first angel arrives the first angel is formalized the first angel is empowered the second angel arrives the second angel is formalized the second angel is empowered and the third angel arrives you could just line these up in that way now, it, it's a little more complicated, I think, what Jeff did. I don't think he just did it simply like that. But you can see how you can do that. You can just take these seven kings are the seven way marks that we have in a line. Now, as far as the meanings of these names, so if we, we look them up, here, I'm going to go to the Bible here. Um, you know, sometimes we get different meanings of these names based on how we, we delve into them. So, for instance, with Manasseh, Um, 
Ooh, that's not working. How do you spell the best of one in? Okay, so the name Manessa is we, it says causing to forget, right? That's Brown Drivers Briggs. If you look in Strong's, causing to forget, the same thing. Um, comes from 5382, to neglect, figuratively to, uh, to neglect, causatively to remit, remove, forget, deprive, exact. Okay. Um, You get the same thing, 3582, 5382, pardon me. Um, just going to look at that word here in Brown Driver's Brakes. <coughs> so, this is the four, five, three. So, 5382. To forget, nasha, so manasha, so causing to forget, um, which would be this PL form. <clears throat> okay, so so we're just saying that that's going to be, they shall be forgotten, that his tire shall be forgotten, uh, um, according to the days of one king. So that one king is the United States. So how do we how do we uh, sort this out? So how do we sort this out? So we got Manessa causing to forget. So we're just saying that that's the days of one king. So that's Manessa. Tyre's going to be forgotten. That's 1798. Anything more about Manessa that we can uh, add to this? Okay, so if we're going to line up Manasseh, who are we lining him up with? We're lining him up with Roman Dragon. Okay, well, no. You wouldn't line him up with Reagan. You would have to line, wouldn't you have to line him up with Bush the first? Because if we're going to, because we are lining him up with Cyrus, are we not? Because we line up the last seven kings of Judah with the first seven kings of Persia. Isn't that what we do? So we would line this up with Cyrus. And if we line Manasseh up with Cyrus, then we have to line him up with Bush the first. You okay with that, Stephen? Yeah, I won't go with that, yeah. Yeah, okay. Just because that's how we line them up. Jeff lined up Manasseh with Cyrus. Dwight was saying something. Yeah. Dwight was saying something. Oh, would, would you say Dwight? I said that that would seem to make sense. Okay. Okay. So then we take Ammon, 
and we would have to line him up with Cambyses, right? And if we line him up with Cambyses, then we have to line him up with Clinton, because we've already done that. I mean, to me, this is the only logical way to do it. You, you can't have in your line, you can't have him lined up one way with one king in one line that's parallel, paralleling it, and then another way with another line, because they all have to line up. Right? I mean, at least in my thinking, that's how I would, would do this. Right? So then you got false murders and, and false murders then would have to line up with, um, Bush the second, right? And then if we were going to uh, do that, we would say, well, this is going to be Darius the first, and he would have to line up with um, Obama. And we just keep doing that down the line, right? You're going to have uh, Xerxes. And Xerxes is Trump. So we can see that Xerxes is Trump in this line because that's how the line was set up. And, and he has to be the fifth, right? So that means we're, we're saying that, you know, Bush the first is the first in this line. You can't have Reagan is the first in this line because we're dealing with the seven kings of Persia and then the presidents of the United States as well as the last seven kings of Judah. Now, um, you know, so this, this line where we have Christ being the eighth, right? So we have the seven. Um, so we'll let's, well, let's finish this line first. So Jehoiachin, now Jehoiachin is uh, the midnight cry symbol. Right, Jehoiakim is at midnight. Jehoiachin's this midnight cry. And um, he's going to line up with Artabanus. So Artabanus lines up with him. And that would have to be, if we're going to be consistent with Biden. Now, what we don't know is we don't know who's going to come after Biden, uh, but we do know that Artaxerxes comes after Artabanus, and that the characteristic of Artabanus is he's a placeholder, right, which would uh, parallel with the idea of Biden. He's just a puppet. Now, Artabanus is, is holding that position for Artaxerxes, so sometimes he's not considered a king of Persia. Um, but he's holding that position there, and then it's given to Artaxerxes. So, um, so we don't know what's going to happen. It's it's possible Biden could die before his term is up. You, you know, he's he's definitely he could be taken out of office is the most likely thing. Uh, because he's completely incompetent to the point where, I mean, he's hardly, hardly functional, right? I don't know if people saw the videos of him in uh, Vietnam. And uh, I think he went to India too or something. But anyway. Um, uh, I think he was, he was talking about a new world order. Okay. I've seen, I've, seen a, I've seen a recent thing. Okay. Talking about that. Well, I haven't seen him talking about a new world order, but I saw him like making absolutely no sense and talking about he, how he's going to go to bed now. Um, but, you know, he's definitely not a functional president. So, uh, so we don't know. He could be removed out of office and you could have somebody else put in his place. And then, you know, 
Now, the idea of the eighth in this line of the seven kings of, of Persia, we never really ever address. That is, we have this last, the first seven kings of Persia, that's what we have. Now, I think after Artaxerxes comes uh, Darius II, if I remember correctly, because um, you're going to have, uh, yeah, you're going to have Darius II, um, and then you're going to have Artaxerxes II, then Amrataeus. Um, so there's going to be these these different kings. And technically, they're they're pharaohs, right? So they're even though they're kings of Persia, they also are ruling Egypt. Um, so anyway, up to Darius the second and Artaxerxes the uh, second, you can definitely have these kings of Persia. And but yet we never address that, so we don't say, well, who's the eighth? Um, we, we've never talked about that, so we don't have any sort of teaching in this movement to address that with art of services. But there is probably a way in which we could understand that these kings are connected. And that's the one thing we really haven't haven't done. Right? We haven't really connected these kings um, in a clear chain of how they fit together, how these different typifications, how they how they fit together at the end of the world. We just don't we don't have a model. We never really completed these studies as far as I'm concerned. But what we do have with a Zedekiah is we do then have an eighth. We do have this overturning, overturning, overturning. And we might do something similar like that with Artaxerxes. As you just say, well, Artaxerxes, not so much Artaxerxes himself as a person, a person, uh, but just the idea of this kingdom that somehow it's overturned. Right, we're going to see Greece next, and then Rome, and then Papal Rome, and I don't know, maybe some way in that way. But we haven't done it, so I don't know how we would do it uh, to be consistent. But but we do know with Zedekiah that the eighth is Christ, because Christ is the last king. Right, he's the one who comes. He comes as a resurrection after these overturnings. So so again, we just have this question here. We don't have the answer to that. Who follows Biden? Right? Could be Trump. Could be somebody else. Uh, we don't know. But what we do know is that this line is more consistent. If we're going to line up uh, these kings with the kings of Judah, right, with the, with the kings of Persia and with the presidents of the United States, this is how we would do it. And then, of course, we would we can lay down the uh, the emperors, the Roman emperors, right? So if you do the Roman emperors, so we just kind of do this all in this one line. It's just a lot easier to see. So we know this is going to be um, <clears throat> Augustus, right? He's going to line up with Bush the first, and then with Clinton, you got Tiberius, and then I don't know, you got Caligula and Claudius. I can't remember which one comes next. Is it Claudius or Caligula? I might have that wrong. But that's what I'm going to put there. And then you're going to have Nero. Oops. And then you're going to have um, uh, 666. Just, just representing those three, and then you're going to have um, how do you spell this? 
spatial, right? I mean, so whatever this is, however we're going to understand that with uh, Galba, um, I can't think of his name, Vitellius, Vitellius is the, the ninth one. Um, can't think of the other guy's name. But anyway, what do we think about this? Any final comments? Maybe not final comments, but any comments? Okay, and then we have, um, so underneath that, we have uh, the first seven kings of Israel. But you're also going to have the last seven kings of Israel. Or pardon me, this is the last seven kings of Israel, not the first seven. So you have last seven kings of Israel. So you have Jer Jeroboam the second, Zechariah, Shalom, Menahem, Pekahiah, Pekah, and Hoshea. Now I have them numbered backwards. And uh, they have really good names too. Um, But, you know, if we were going to line these up, we could just say, okay, well, Jeroboam II lines up with Cyrus, Bush the first, and Augustus. Zechariah lines up. But we don't know much about these kings. I mean, we have these names, the symbols from the meanings of their names. But, you know, we don't have a, a real good understanding of how this fits together. And, it, and it's kind of interesting, you have a Manasseh causing to forget. In this line of Israel, you have God has remembered. Of course, in this case, God remembering is not necessarily a good thing because it's followed by retribution. Uh, but then you have a comforter, Menahem. Jo Jehovah has observed, Jehovah sees. And then Hoshea, his name means salvation. It's basically connected to the name of Christ. Jehoshua, right? Jehovah the Savior. So, um, and you see Jeroboam too, right? He's, of course, uh, Jeroboam the first is going to be the one who starts northern Israel. Jeroboam the two is going to be the one who uh, begins this last seven kings of Israel. So, you know, we could put uh, the first seven kings of Israel over top of these last seven kings of Israel. And we do the same thing with the first seven kings of Judah. So what is this telling us? Just in before we close here. What, what is this telling us? What were these lines meant to do? Why were we examining these, these kings? I mean, we know we started doing it because of the four seven times and connecting those seven kings to the seven thunders. Because I, I don't think we really ever finished this study, to be honest. Um, I know I have a chart. Let's see if I can find this. Um, okay, wherever this chart is. That's the one I had there. Um, just look like the same charts. What was this other chart? Um, because it probably doesn't have these all marked out like that. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, it's not going to be there. I know I got a lot of charts here. I, I know what it looks like. I just can't, uh, don't remember, because it, it's got a lot of information all in one chart. Um, it's not there. Make this bigger, just hang on. Um, here it is. Okay, so here's the chart. Now, um, it's just numbers. So 
This chart represents uh, the first seven kings of of um, of Judah. Now I have the numbers backwards going seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And then I have um, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. This would be uh, the last seven kings of Judah. Uh, no, those would be the last seven kings of Israel. And then I have um, trying to figure out what this is. This doesn't look right. It looks like it's been messed up in some way. So you got those little eggs with the numbers in them. Those are supposed to line up in some way. These ones line up. So this would be Judah. These eggs don't line up with anything properly. Anyway, what I was trying to show here is you have this 25-20 for Israel, the 25-20 for Judah. And then, so this here you're going to see, this is going to be uh, Manasseh. But this is somehow supposed to line up. So I don't know why it doesn't line up. Um, yeah, so this needs to line up in some way. Um, let's see if I do this. Sorry about this. Gonna have to figure this out. I don't know if that works. No, it doesn't work. See, Israel, you're supposed to have Hoshea here. It's supposed to line up. So if this was the last seven kings of Israel, you'd have Hoshea, right? And then you're going to have, I don't know what these are. Oh, those that might work. And then this is... These don't line up, though. Anyway, I'm going to have to think this through, what, what it is I actually drew here. I mean, I think this is the seven thunders here at the end. And I don't know what this seven is. This would be the same. So I don't know what I did with this. Anyway. Maybe somebody can make heads or heads out of this, heads and tails out of this. But but you you see the point. Maybe this one here. Ah, this is a better one. Okay, we'll look at this one uh, to, uh, on Sunday. Okay, yeah, this is the one I wanted. This one is uh, comparing all of these histories. That looks better. Okay. So looking at this roughly, you can kind of see what it is, hopefully. So we'll look at this. I'll actually uh, send this out in an email, and, uh, and people can take a look at it. So any final questions before we close with prayer? Hopefully I didn't confuse you all with these diagrams, but we will look at them. Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study here today. And we just know, Lord, we have a lot to sort through and to study on our own. And we just ask that you can be with us uh, before we meet again to study. Uh, be with us throughout this day. May your angels watch over us. And uh, may those searching for truth uh, have an open heart and mind. And we pray also, Lord, that as we study these things together, that uh, we can share and that we can correct one another when we are in error. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.